welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk. And today we have some very, very special guests with us. Uh, well, as as per always, I'm I'm Eli. And I'm Kylie. And and we run Cinema Phone. But today we have with us uh, Graham and Hiromi, who were the respectively director and producer on the film Queer Japan, which we covered recently on the channel. So thank you both for joining us. Yeah. Thanks Hello. for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, yes, of course. Oh, we're so excited to have you. Yeah. I can't wait to talk about this movie. I loved this movie. <laughs> oh, so, so we glad. really loved your review. So thank oh. you for doing that. Thank you Aww. so much. Do you want to both um, introduce yourselves? So my name is Graham Colbeans. I am a filmmaker, writer, and um, manga editor in in my um, side gig. And I directed the film Queer Japan. Um, and it is a kaleidoscopic look at LGBTQ culture um, in Japan and everything beyond those labels, um, as much as we could fit into one feature film. So I hope that y'all will go check it out. Hi, um, everyone. My name is Hiromi Iida, and um, I'm a producer of Queer Japan. And uh, usually I work with uh, foreign media who come to Japan, and I work as a producer or coordinator in um, entertainment field. But however, um, since the COVID-19 happened, so no one is coming. <laughs> so yeah, I've been um, trying to do something new and I'm still searching for new opportunities. But yeah, I'm so happy that I could talk about a film because it has been uh, some time, you know, since the film is out and uh, I'm so excited, yeah, to be on this channel today. Thank you. Oh, of yeah, course. Thank, thank you. you for thank you for coming on. Yeah. Yeah. I I've act, I've been looking forward to this. Like mm -hmm. since we watched the film. Yeah. Like it was it was so good. And I I know that y'all watched um the review of it, but truly like it was it was uh, something that I think is was needed. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a I I don't want to say genre, but it's it's something that's lacking in Japanese cinema. And mm -hmm. like and I'm so glad that it exists. And I, I hope that this encourages more people to, to seek it out and, and learn from it. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's really nice to hear that. And I feel like, um, yeah, there are just a few hidden gems of really amazing LGBT uh, Japanese cinema out there. And I noticed in, in your review comments, someone um, pointed out the film Funeral Parade of Roses. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, this 1968 experimental film about drag queens in Shinjuku and it's one of my favorite movies it's so beautiful so I'm I'm just happy to be referenced in the same breath <laughs> oh that's awesome <laughs> that is really <laughs> cool <laughs> I feel like we've had that recommended a few times before but then for one reason or another um each each time like June comes around and, and we're trying to look for LGBT mm. movies for just for one reason or another, that one ends up slipping through the cracks, but we definitely want to cover that one in the future. Mm -hmm. Maybe this will be the year. Yeah, may maybe, yeah, maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that movie is just a blast. It's really fun. Yeah, mm. I'm excited to, to look into it. I am too. I didn't know anything about it. So even mm -hmm. just your description of it, I'm like, oh, I am here for it. That sounds really fun. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, pretty groundbreaking for its time and also um, uh, influenced Stanley Kubrick's uh, Clockwork Orange. He mm -hmm. sort of borrowed some of the techniques from it. So I, it really has an important place in film history. Oh, oh I, yeah. I did not know that. Oh, that's good to know. But yeah, we can talk about Queer Japan too. <laughs> I don't know yeah, to yeah we're, we're here for your movie. <laughs> yeah. F Funeral Parade of Roses will have its, its day later. <laughs> <laughs> so I I guess um what what are what are your respective histories with um like Japan uh Japanese language which we were talking about this a little bit before mm -hmm. we started recording but uh Japan Japanese language and the LGBTQ community 
I want to point out that Hiromi has made some really amazing um, short documentary films in the LGBT community. And that's kind of how we came together. Um, I saw her short films on YouTube and then reached out over Twitter. So that's kind of, that's what um, sort of brought our journeys together at the beginning. Um, for me, I started learning Japanese in high school and um, I took one year of it, like as a senior, I had stopped taking French and wanted to learn Japanese. And it didn't really like, I didn't get too far in it, but um, I think it was about a decade later, I started picking it up again in my twenties um, when I was working with uh, gay manga artists. Mm -hmm. I, I worked on a couple of English language collections of gay manga including work from Gengar Otagame, who's like the master of gay erotic manga, mm -hmm. and Jiraiya, and all these other really iconic um, gay artists from Japan. Mm -hmm. So that's when I was like, okay, I really need to start learning for real. And it took, it took a few years before I could start having like some semi-fluent basic conversations, but I, I think uh, the five months that we spent shooting most of the bulk of Queer Japan was the time that I, I really started to um, feel the language sink into my consciousness. And, and um, I, I started needing to speak it because there were so many people around um, I wanted to talk to for this film and for just everyday life. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense that basically being Im immersed um, in the culture and in the language is what helped drive your learning for it. You said you said that it was a solid five months that you were filming. Yeah, so we shot things earlier than that and later than that, but the main production was um, April through the end of August, mm -hmm. um, or maybe March through August in 2016. Okay. So it's been been a minute. It's almost five years now since we were shooting, and um, it's really making it makes me nostalgic looking at the film now. So we were just talking about that, Hiromi and I, before we jumped on with y'all. Oh, that's so cool. Were Were you both there for the shooting? Uh, yes. Um, so Graham reached out to me, like he said on Twitter, and that was about a month before uh, he actually came to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. So, and um, the day we met in Shinjuku, mm -hmm. we had a coffee and discussed about the film. That was actually the first day of the shoot. And he was like, you know, we were having a conversation over coffee and, you know, he was explaining about the film and everything. And he said, well, by the way, I'm going to this park to film this dancer, you know, which you use, I'm sure you saw a beautiful uh, Sakura cherry blossom in the background and the dancer was dancing. Mm -hmm. That was shot on the very first day I met Graham. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we just jumped right into it. Yes. Oh, well, no wonder it's nostalgic. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my favorite shoots that we did. Um, Atsushi Matsuda, he's the buto dancer in the film. Mm -hmm. And it, I just admire his art form so much. And anytime we get to hang out uh, is a pleasure. And just filming him move is is like candy for a filmmaker <laughs> yeah mm, yes it's very hypnotic I think would be the best way to describe it I would agree completely. Yeah. Yeah. it's it's um it's en en enchanting mm -hmm. I think it, it definitely draws your attention and keeps you yes you know sucked in yes yes wow. absolutely mm -hmm. so glad to hear that Oh yeah. Oh, well, the whole movie was like that, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Because the, the way that you described it, like kind of kaleidoscopic. Yeah. yeah. I think the, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. entire I don't I don't even know. Like the structure, the editing, the just the way that the entire thing is put together, it's just it flows together so well. I yeah, I I mm -hmm. actually I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but I really liked the structure of the movie because I felt like, you know, we would we would, you know, hang out with one person for a little while. 
and then we would go meet some other people mm -hmm. but then we would eventually come back to that same person and it's kind it was kind of like I I think I had said on that review that it was like talking with a group of friends or a group of people mm -hmm. it just really felt like warm and comforting and I I oh, love yeah. the way that that you put it together in editing to make it feel that way I yeah. really really like that Thanks so much. I'm really, it was nice to hear that in the interview and it's, it's a nice to hear it again. I just like, it, it felt difficult to um, construct a, a structure that was anything but this like organic way that we were shooting. Mm -hmm. um, we, we just, kept meeting more and more people. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times we would get suggestions from um, some cast members to speak to other people. So it felt like the film was kind of evolving as we went through production. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted it to come across as sort of a non-hierarchical mm -hmm. experience where although it does point out a lot of people who've done Im really important work in the community, it's not putting them like above or um, other people who might just be trying to live their lives, um, but sharing everybody's experiences on an equal playing field. Yeah. I, I really picked up on that and I, I appreciated that. It definitely felt like we were just meeting meeting these, all these different people in, in a way that, like you said, was organic and mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm a level playing field like yeah this, it, the people like, at, at no point in the movie is there any clear distinction of like this section of the movie is about this type of person yeah or, or or you know and then this section is about these people and this section is about these people it's all just kind of woven through throughout and mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that you yeah you achieved that of making it feel like regardless of the um I, I guess like subjective importance or whatever you might want to say of those people's contributions to the community uh they're all just people mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a, a really good way of putting it I think um you also mentioned in the review that you liked the fact that there was no voiceover and I, mm -hmm. I really appreciated that too because we wanted it to be a multi-subjective experience where all these people are speaking in their own words without the mediation of me or someone else saying like trying to contextualize it in a different way mm -hmm. right so so you intended that from the beginning then to have it just be in the uh interviewees words throughout yeah i think hiromi isn't that something that we talked about pretty early on yeah mm -hmm. We, we flirted with the idea of having maybe like Vivian Sato do a voiceover, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it kind of felt like she, she provided a good bookend to the film with her segments anyway. And it, it, it felt better just having it, um, this like group of interviews without anything like imposed upon it. Yeah. yeah 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 I get that now and and you had mentioned like throughout the production you just you had more and more suggestions and and other people were were brought on and my understanding is that not everybody you spoke with is in the film is that correct yeah that's okay. correct um are you uh, like do you have any plans with um like like releasing that uh, remaining footage or we um, yeah, so we shot so many interviews mm -hmm. that um, not all of it could fit into one feature film, unfortunately, but um, we really valued everyone who wanted to sit down and speak with us. And I have um, three deleted scenes um, coming out on the DVD and Blu-ray release. Oh, so cool. you'll at least get to see a, a little bit more content on there. Oh, that's awesome. That's cool. Okay. And you had mentioned the the Blu-ray DVD release that's coming around the end of March. Is that correct? Yeah, our North American distributor, Altered Innocence, is putting it out um, sometime in mid to late March. So keep okay. an eye out. Okay, we'll we'll also um, be posting that when that when we see yeah. that come out, we can um, yeah, definitely let everybody know about that as well. Definitely. So. Oh, that's great. 
Oh yeah, that's exciting. Do, um, speaking of, you said the North American distributor is Altered Innocence. Uh, this isn't something that we had necessarily talked about before, but it just occurred to me, do you have uh, distributors anywhere else, like in Japan or just anywhere else in general? Um, so we were just talking about this right before oh. we got on with you, but it's something that's in the works. Um, we're trying to figure out the best strategy for a Japanese theatrical release because COVID is making everything strange. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's something we've been talking about. And um, once the film comes out in Japan, then we're going to have um, an international release after that. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Um, Hiromi, is that something that you're that you're kind of leading? Is that is the more of like the Japanese side of things? Um, are you kind of handling that side? Yeah, uh, I work with like Graham, of course, uh, but um, mostly so we talk and a um, lot of the discussion or the approaching the distributors. I do, yeah, the most of the talking part. Okay. But you know, we but yeah, we always work together. Okay. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. Hiromi's professionalism is supreme, and like I'm this weird foreigner, so I feel <laughs> like a lot of times, if if I hadn't had Hiromi by my side, people would have just like given me a strange look and not necessarily like agreed to be in the film. So I I always. Um, have to thank Hiromi for um, bringing the professionalism to this project. Oh, thank you for it. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, you, with your review and with, I also have like other people talking about this film that being so fantastic because there is no actual like directors point of view in this film right, the, right. Yeah. you know talking about like just like you said you know if you feel like you're having a conversation with the people we featured in the film that is beautiful thing and I think um one of the biggest um thing that happened was I think it's Graham's um like a personality you know he has this charm you know, he just, you know, he, he loves people and he's so humble and respective. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like he's more like Japanese than I am. Yeah. So, <laughs> so his personality made like everyone talk so like um, friendly and nice. And, you know, they were all like, it seems like everyone was so comfortable on camera. And I think that was Graham's charm was making that possible. So even though we don't have his point of view in the film, but his charm is like everywhere. And that's what created our film great. So I, 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 ha I just had to mention that. <laughs> oh, thank you, Hiromi. I, that's, you're making me blush. I, oh, no. <laughs> that, that's just the makeup. <laughs> yeah, I, I did a little eyeshadow for this, but um, it was definitely a team effort. I feel like most of the interviews, it was actually me and Hiromi on set and nobody else. Occasionally we had translators and occasionally my co-producer Annie, she was there, but it's it was very much um, a combination of my cheeky charm and um, Hiromi's grace in in actually asking the interviews. So it's kind of a conversation we conducted together. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so you're like a tag team. Mm -hmm. oh, maybe awesome. maybe like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, on on that note, how you so you said that as you went along, you ended up getting more and more interviews than you necessarily like planned or mm -hmm. that you envisioned from the beginning. So how did you, how did you start? Like, who did you begin with uh, trying to get in, ton in, in contact with? And what was your, what was your initial vision before you ended up getting in contact with all these other people? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think 
so it really started in 2015. I started, I wrote this um, application for a fellowship from the Japan US Friendship Commission. It's a nonprofit organization supported by the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts in America, and Bunkacho, which is the cultural, the Agency for Cultural Affairs in Japan. And um, they support five artists doing um, pro projects that um, bring together um, Japanese and North American artists. So um, I was one of the proposals chosen in 2015. And so I started that year, which is like, it's the year before the fellowship, um, but I did like a few interviews with um, some of the people who you see at the end of the film and who you see throughout the film. So Gengaro Tagame is someone I had been working with for a few years. Mm -hmm. And um, he introduced us to Hiroshi Hasegawa, mm -hmm. um, his co-editor at G-Men magazine. Mm -hmm. And then um, some of the other people who were there since the very beginning are uh, Nogi Sumiko, the artist who does performances in a sheep costume. And um, we had Atsushi at the very beginning. I, I originally met him in 2014. He, I saw him dancing in a gay bar in Tokyo and was just like, I have to be friends with this person because they're amazing. <laughs> and it just kind of unfilled from there. So, so it sounds like it started with like half a dozen people that you already knew. And then it ended up being, did, I want to say on the website, it said more than 100 people. We, we did a hundred interviews, but it's about 35 people who you see in the film. Okay, um, okay. And okay. yeah, so it really expanded outward from there. Um, and also I have to say the Bunkacho people um, put us in touch with Vivian Sato. So that was like one of the, it really like, defined the film in a lot of ways yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also because it was th through this cultural agency um they were able to uh get us a formal letter sent to Aya Kamikawa mm -hmm. who's a politician that you see in the film right and I feel like having the support of this organization behind us really um lent us some credibility yeah that was absolutely. awesome yeah that that was really, really cool to see. It's like, it's like we had talked about before, just the array of personalities that we see presented mm -hmm. is I think fantastic. It, it's it's like you, it is, it's a, I mean, obviously it's a spectrum and it feels like you hit every point on it in a, in a way that felt respectful. And I just, I really appreciated that. Hiromi, I wanted to ask you about your YouTube channel because Graham had said that's how he found you, um, that you had posted um, short video, short films on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. can, would you be able to send that to us so that we could put it in the in the description, or is it not a public? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, actually, that's not on my YouTube channel, but that was for uh, Vice Japan, oh. and you can still watch it. So I'll send you the link. Okay. Yes, that yeah. would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. On your YouTube channel, you have some videos with Maya, don't you? Um, I think so. I haven't updated my YouTube channel, so I, I should check it again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's been a while for me, too. I need to get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We should mention that, too, that you, you don't just do uh, films like this, but you also do YouTube. Yeah, I have um, done a few episodes of a sort of comedy stretching show called Stretching yeah. with Graham Colbeans. <laughs> um, and it's something that I was, I started during the Trump era to try and uh, calm myself down while I talked about the like political issues that were burning on my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I've been meaning to make a new episode. So um, keep an eye out. Okay, oh. that's exciting. <laughs> I know we had a discussion about potential ASMR, so. That's true. That's true. <laughs> we'll collab. We'll do we some just, ASMR. Yes. Together. Oh, we just, we need yeah. to start a collaborative ASMR adventure. <laughs> With Graham. Yes. <laughs> All right. Coast to coast stretching. 
<laughs> stretch all the way across the stretch, continent. Stretch across North America. <laughs> yes. You mentioned that it started, that the film started with that uh, grant, right? But the film was also at least partially crowdfunded. Am, am I correct on that? Yeah, that's right. After we got the fellowship from the Japan-US Friendship Commission, um, we launched a Kickstarter campaign and that funded about two thirds of the production budget. And, um, and so that was really nice to be able to um, make a film using the, the power of crowdsourcing and just the passion of all of these fans who wanted to learn more about some of their favorite artists who were in the film and just people who wanted to learn more about Japanese LGBT culture in general. Mm. Yeah, definitely. What, was that um, the first time that you had done any sort of crowdfunding or had on your previous projects, had you done any, any crowdsourcing? Um, that was the first major crowdsourcing campaign that I did. I think some of the other shorts I was a part of, um, they did a smaller crowdfunding um, to, to come up with the budget, but um, this was like a, more of a big undertaking. And I, I'm still like, I'm going to be sending out DVDs to all of the um, people who supported at that level on Kickstarter. So oh, okay. um, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm really like glad that our supporters could still um, just support throughout the entire project in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Was that, so was that back in like, that was in 2016 that you were doing that? Yeah, that's right. In, um, in spring 2016. Okay, okay. What, um, what was the timeline like after you wrapped with shooting? Because mm. one, thing, one thing before I forget that I wanted to ask is, has the film had any releases prior to the North American release? We did a festival run that started in Tokyo in 2019. Um, we had our world premiere at the Tokyo... Uh, Rainbow Reel Festival, and it used to be called Tokyo um, Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, but it's been yeah. around for th 30 years, and we were really um, honored to have the closing night film position um, mm -hmm. and just be able to show the film with like 19 members of the cast and crew there That's and awesome. a full house, and it was just like this really celebratory moment for mm -hmm. everyone in the project, I feel. Yeah, that's, oh, that's, that's so incredible. Cool. Um, I'm sure that must have been awesome for all of them, too. Yeah. A reunion, kind of. You want yeah, to talk that, about that? Was that the first time that they had um, had the opportunity to see it? Well, actually, um, during the editing process, when we had our first cut, um, we decided to share it with um, the main members of the cast and get their feedback. Um, and that really helped us in the editing process. So mm -hmm. I was living in Los Angeles, working on the edit and Hiromi set up a screening just for like 10 members of the cast. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was so helpful to have their voices and input in that process. That's awesome. Oh, I love that. I love that. Like, like, like we had talked about uh, previously that it feels like a conversation that you're having as an audience member with the people that you're interviewing and like e that even goes so far into the way that the film was made that you all had a conversation with the people and I just yeah. I, I love that. I love I love how like interwoven it all is mm -hmm. and it's just the sense of community that I get from it. Yeah, they've been like still um, I still get in touch with like um, Vivian. Mm -hmm. You know, we, yeah, yeah, we keep communication. And um, she had been one of the biggest help creating this film. And um, yeah, giving us like feedbacks. And also um, she's been helping us or uh, giving us advice about like um, theatrical release in Japan. Because, you okay. know, she also works with like, uh, filmmakers and um she's also a film critic oh, so okay yeah, yeah through this cool. film you know we were blessed to have like so many uh, great people you know still supporting us 
that's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Vivian is like the go-to person to get a quote for your art film when it comes out in Japan. She is just like one of the most respected um, filmmaker or not um, critics of art filmmaking. Um, you know, she doesn't really do uh, reviews of the big mass releases, but she has really interesting thoughts on a lot of the like. Um, uh, cult favorites and uh, mm. underseen films. It's it's really cool that you were able to have that communication with someone like that, that mm -hmm. and that you still maintain that to this day and that hopefully it'll, you know, continue and that it will help drive the theatrical release as well. Mm -hmm. That's that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like I feel like that kind of goes in um in line with uh, again with with the the whole atmosphere of the film of it being like mm -hmm. a, a community thing and like a conversation mm -hmm. um and it sounds like from the editing of the film to the release of the film just everything every step along the way it sounds like it's been a really big collaborative thing yeah For, even if you two yeah, were the people like the main people behind it it feels mm -hmm. like everybody was pretty much involved with it from start to finish in some capacity. Mm -hmm. That's definitely, we wanted it to feel like a collaborative approach. Um, and, you know, when people ask me, who's the audience for this film? My first answer is always like everyone, I want everyone to see it. Um, yes. but, but ultimately the audience I cared most about was the community that the film reflects. Mm -hmm. We wanted them to feel like it reflected them in a in a way that they could relate to was positive and um yeah so that was always a, a huge priority yeah yeah and the um you had mentioned that you were doing the editing in in LA were were you the only person doing the editing on the film I worked with a couple of assistant editors throughout the process um my friend Kyle McCloskey mm -hmm. and um we had another great inter uh, great assistant editor in Japan um, who, who Hiromi got to know at, afterwards and they worked together a couple of times or, is, or am I getting this all wrong? Was it Kai or? Yeah, Kai. You, you also shot some stuff for the film with Kai. Oh yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. We shot um, additional footage um, with Tagame and um, gone mm -hmm. about when they actually they oh what was that oh the ototo no otto the the my brother's husband yeah the my brother's husband yeah right. yeah yeah so that um comic was um the japanese broadcast channel decided to make a drama a really uh, like heartwarming uh, tv program from mm -hmm. that comic and we and there was like a, a talk show about that within the community mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we shot that additional footage with Kai mm -hmm. uh, yeah she's a great filmmaker as well and she shot it and I think she helped you with some of the footage um the editing yeah so yeah and that was Kai Kai did a really great job just yeah. um, helping me prepare scenes for editing and just l making the process move a lot faster. But mm -hmm. yeah, it was it was a big editing undertaking, especially with without like a clear structure. So mm -hmm. we had so many great pieces and it was like, how do they all fit together? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get that. With the, um, the translation, um, did you did you have somebody doing all the translation work for the English subtitles or? Um... There, it was a team effort, but the lead translator I have to credit is Jocelyn Allen. She's an amazing translator from Toronto who um, has done a lot of really uh, well-known manga translations. Okay. And we got to know each other at Toronto Comic Art Festival when Tagame came 
and she was his translator there. So um, we had her for the first month of the shoot. She was in a lot of the interviews and then she coordinated all of the transcripts and translations uh, with like a whole team of, of um, translators. Okay. okay, that's awesome. Yeah, that is really cool. I, I always like learning about that side of it, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a Japanese learner, because there are times where we'll be watching a movie or something and be like, that, that's not what they said. They said something different. So yes. I, I like... I like learning the stories of 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 how the translation came to be, mm -hmm. and because it's such a it's an art. I feel like um, yeah. the translation yeah. is because it you can't do it, it for one. Mm -mm. Yeah, and um, you know we try to uh, highlight some of the terms in the film that are unique to mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese queer community, yeah. and. Um, just take a moment to show people their multiple definitions because mm -hmm. there is a lot that gets lost if you just translate a word directly or into something comparable you might be missing out on a lot of information mm -hmm. i i appreciated that aspect Definitely. a lot because there were words that i was not familiar with no mm -hmm. no i think of the ones that you translated i had only heard one maybe two of them mm -hmm. and so the rest of it yeah that was definitely definitely appreciated yeah it was, it was helpful to mm -hmm. have that there with with every person that you interviewed um the setup and the 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 framing and and the background that everybody had was really like really really striking mm -hmm. was did did each of the people that you interviewed set up the area in which you would interview them or did you set it up or was it just kind of happenstance? It, that's a good question. It was a mixture of both of those things. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes the interviewee took the reins and decided the background they wanted to use. And sometimes we came up with some creative ideas together. Um, so for instance, Gengaro Tagame, um, I think like a lot of Japanese people actually that are especially people we talked to for the film weren't really comfortable with us shooting in his apartment. Um, and it's it's a very private space for him. Yeah. Um, so I was like, you know, why don't we go to a BDSM love hotel and have you sit in this like opulent room full of chains and things. And he was like, okay, sure. I'll just, <laughs> just like, he humored me in a way. <laughs> Oh, and another thing we have to mention is Simon, you know. Absolutely. Um, Do you want to tell that yeah, story? Yeah, sure. Um, the Queen of the West, the drag queen called Simone Fukayuki. You remember the, the lady in the red outfit mm -hmm. with like a full naked guy in the background? Yes. Everything was set up by her, the Simone. Okay. And um, yeah, <laughs> so when we actually, the Tagame introduced us to Simone. And um, so when she agreed to do the interview, she asked me, like, um, oh, she actually, she told me, like, she would like to um, prepare everything, the location, background, and everything. Mm -hmm. And one thing she asked me was, like, hey, um, how much nudity can we have in your film? <laughs> uh, like, um, <laughs> that'd be great. I can have like underwears on so that you know we won't have time um blowing out something you know <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. like, oh okay that's a bummer but okay yeah so that <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so that's that's funny that you bring up that particular scene because that was one of the ones that I was mm -hmm. like that sparked that question for me. That yes. the um the the final yeah, I so. scene. Is that the <laughs> final scene? Which one? The very last shot or, or like, the last like interview. Mm -hmm. The last that. scene was oh, we shot a, a discussion at Kokolo Cafe, which um was this iconic space in Shinjuku Nichome one of the oldest restaurants mm -hmm. uh had been around for 30 years and it just announced that they were closing um yeah. last week. Mm -hmm. so one oh, of the uh, losses to the pandemic 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was that particular scene with, um, with Simone, you said? Uh, yeah. Okay, with Simone, that, I, that, that spot, I was like, okay, who set this up? Because this is, this is tantalizing right here. <laughs> <laughs> it deserves like a pr production designer credit on the film for that yeah. one. Oh. Definitely. <laughs> I guess this one. Okay, I gotcha. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> the only question she asked is do you want them to have um, black blindfolds on or silver sparkly ones? <laughs> and I was like, sparkly? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, everything should be sparkly, right? I mean, it, it <laughs> yeah. Be, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I love that. That's that's amazing. Because yeah, it's like you said, that was the one that we. The, <laughs> that, there, there, there were a few the moments. Couch. There was the, the one. Um, oh, oh, the yes. couch. Yes. Oh, Vivian was laying on the couch. Yes. Vivian, yes, yes was on the couch. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we found. Actually, that was shot in this like a uh, uh, studio. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's like one of those places you can book by the hour for your photo yeah. shoot. Okay. Oh, okay. And I saw on their, I saw the picture of that set on their website, and I was like, oh, this totally matches Vivian's whole vibe, and mm -hmm. she's she's really into like nineteenth century illustration and. Mm -hmm. Uh, Beardsley and um, so she's like got this kind of old school aesthetic and I, it felt like a perfect match for her. Yeah. Oh that's so cool. That's awesome. I, I'm not familiar if we have anything like that in the U.S. but I have definitely I know some other um, content creators on YouTube mm -hmm. who use spaces like that oh, um, yes. who are based in either Japan or South Korea or mm -hmm. somewhere like that, like where you can rent spaces like that, like studio spaces. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that exists in Pro the US. Maybe, probably maybe, in certain parts. maybe in your part of the world. Yeah, like probably <laughs> on the here. West Coast where there's more, more production it's, it's in general. It's definitely like more of a thing in Japan. Mm -hmm. And one of the studios that we were looking at, um, I wanted to rent a room there and then they were, it's it was only for photo shoots so like the video we couldn't shoot video there but i think they make a lot of money from like high school girls who take really cool selfies in spaces like that oh, and yes. so okay. it was like uh, okay we'll we'll use this other space <laughs> okay. okay 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 so that's cool that it was it was a mix like you said like half half of them were other people setting them up and then half of them were you setting them up mm -hmm. and then it's, some of them i'm sure like were just kind of how things were like oh what were their names the the two the two young women who the the one worked as a i think she was a teacher and oh that was yeah yeah the the couple the yeah. japanese yeah, yeah. I, I think that was shot at their apartment right right yeah. so it was just that's just kind of how it was right yeah, yeah okay. and Toyo, they have such a cute apartment um chica toyota is her name and mm -hmm. they, and actually liz goes by lee now and they them pronouns so oh, okay oh, okay, okay. like people's identities have shifted since we filmed um mm -hmm. the nature of identity yeah and, yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, I loved their apartment. So many cute toys in there. In that we were commenting on that yes. while we were like, we were like, look at all the Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> it was adorable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is an oddly specific one, but this is one that we were wondering while we were watching the movie. So there was that performance that you filmed and that was talked about with uh, the performance artist Cyborg, where they. Uh, had the the mother pig who gave birth and the pig piglets came and suckled and then they were taken away by the guy dressed as a farmer so this is a really oddly specific question but the the aspect of the piglets being taken away to slaughter mm -hmm. was that actually shown on stage in some capacity or was it just told through voiceover or implied well in that performance so cyborg has done so many amazing um, performances. And in that one, 
you don't really see the slaughter happening if i'm remembering correctly you the mm -hmm. it's just very ominous and then the farmer takes them one by one off stage and they disappear so okay. in that one it was like a little bit more subdued but in some of their performances cyborg has had um like pigs that are getting chopped up and they're like their guts are being pulled out and oh, wow. it gets a little bit into the like cartoonishly violent territory um right. but also kind of like nauseating they really pull you in different directions and uh emotionally and then mm -hmm. at the end of of their performances sometimes everyone breaks out into a song from like a pop song from the 80s and it's just really fun oh wow Oh, that would be really cool to see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were just like, how did that end? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was, it was very specific. Yeah. No, that, that one was more just for me because I, I wanted closure on that. <laughs> I feel um, like, I feel like the film like implied that, but we were like, but, but did but, it show more? But, like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. No, that was, that's definitely one of those examples of which I feel like there there are a bunch of examples uh, of this throughout the film and I think that this is what any like good documentary should do is it makes you want to learn more yeah so there's like there's this mm. manga artists and you learn mm. about them here and you're like oh let me go check that out and learn more or you learn about mm. this performance artist and you're like oh let me go check that out and learn more and mm. you, you, you know what I mean so yeah. that, that was definitely one of those moments for me where I was like I have to know more <laughs> nice mm. That makes me happy. I, I feel like if, if people Google at least one of the people in the film afterwards, then like it's a mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. For either of you, since you said you, you'd both worked uh, with film and with the LGBT community in Japan in varying capacities prior to this, did either of you have any preconceptions about the community that were either like reaffirmed or uh, proven wrong while while working on the film. Mm. Good question. Do you want to start, Hiromi? Yeah. Um. Well, actually, I don't think I had any like preconceptions mm -hmm. because um, I had and still have many friends in the community, but I never thought or dig deep, dug deep about their backgrounds or anything. They were just my friends, period. Mm. So I never needed to think about that community itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were just there in my life. And um, so in that sense, I did not have any like uh, preconceptions. However, um, throughout this working on this film, I realized myself I did not know much about the community and also I didn't know there were so many different variety of the people in this in a queer community mm -hmm. the beautiful people so I must play I, I think once I told Graham that um you can use he can use me as one of the audience or viewer of the mm -hmm. film because um, there were so many people I did not even know. And um, it was a blessing to get to know those people. It's just, it's just like I was one of the, um, the viewer mm -hmm. to actually yeah. watch the film and you know, have a conversation just like you guys you know, or other audience. Mm -hmm. So that was, yeah, very um, a great inspiration for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i i feel like i agree there's even with like the research i had done beforehand i didn't expect all of the variety that we um got to experience all the different types of people who we met some of them um i hadn't ever like heard about before we even before we started shooting so it was a really awesome learning experience and social experience to mm -hmm. sit down with these people and hear the story of someone like Puyumi Yamamoto, who is the, um, she established the Deaf LGBT Center in Osaka. Mm -hmm. 
That's and right. um, has done a lot of really important work at the intersection of the LGBT community and the deaf community. Um, so someone like her, and I, I really didn't know Cyborg's work beforehand. So mm -hmm. sitting down with her in her studio and hearing all of these amazing projects she had worked on was such a delight. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I feel like it, as a filmmaker, my mind was expanded just through the process. And, and I hope that that comes across to the viewer too. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what I mean, I, I can say as a viewer that I, I like, like, kind of like what you're saying, I didn't necessarily have any preconceived notions, but there's so much here to yes. learn. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and that, and that I wasn't aware of, again, because this is something that's, there's not a lot of information, especially in English. Right. Um, right. You know, for, for people to, to, I guess, have this kind of experience and this um potential to like open up this, th that kind of discussion among among friends yeah there there are sadly um few films and television programs that have gone into depth exploring um this the queer community in japan i i noticed that y'all had done a review of shinjuku boys so i was yes. glad yeah. that um that beautiful film was uh celebrated on your channel and yeah it's like um i mean as a member of the queer community i hear histories all the time that are very rooted in north america and europe mm -hmm. but um you know japan is like the third biggest economy in the world and there's so much culture coming out of there mm -hmm. that's really amazing and underseen in the west um, so I'm hoping this just like gets people more excited to learn about these people and others um, mm -hmm. in queer Japan. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think I think this it the 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 movie functions as a great stepping stone mm -hmm. for that. And and mm -hmm. I I feel like I feel like I probably said I I think I said this in in the review, but I feel for that reason like this is important. Like. Like Shinjuku Boys, like you, like you were talking about, um, where, you know, you you look back at that movie now, and that was made in ninety five or ninety six, and so it's like this time capsule of what Shinjuku Nishome was, and specifically, the, um, oh my gosh, I'm totally having a brain for it, the Onabe, uh, who who were working there, yeah, it, yeah, it's really interesting to look at that and see how it's changed and how transmasculine culture has evolved into these new bars and spaces and parties. Mm, yes, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this this movie is really important for the same reason, because it's, I can't do math, 20 years, 20 years after that. Mm. Um, so it's like another chunk of time mm -hmm. um, and, and you captured so many different so 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 many different demographics and so many different parts of the community mm -hmm. so you can look back at it and say in 20 2015 2016 this is what was going on at that time mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. thank you yeah it's i'm i'm really glad that we captured that moment and mm -hmm. it feels like after the pandemic nothing's going to be quite the same so <laughs> it, it really is a time capsule already mm -hmm. <laughs> it is yeah, yeah, definitely. Even even now, watching anything that was made prior to COVID nineteen, it's like like seeing like large groups of people all together, yeah. and it's just like, oh my gosh, like we never even thought about that before, mm -hmm. and now it's just like ah, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's bizarre. It, so yeah. I I can totally see where you're coming from there. Yeah, that it it already has gotten to that point because mm -hmm. of what has transpired over the past year and a half. And also just thinking about um, sort of LGBT Japanese cinema as a genre, I want to shout out our friend Hikaru Toda and her mm -hmm. film of Love and Law, mm -hmm. which yeah. um, I'm not sure if it's had a North American release yet, but it's definitely out in the UK and I think in Japan. 
Um, but it's this great documentary about um, a pair of lawyers who are also husbands and fight for civil rights in Japan. Oh, wow. That sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, any any other recommendations that you have for uh, Japanese LGBT cinema, especially that has English subtitles or any sort of official release in English is, is greatly appreciated because because I mean, like we're saying, that it's it's something that is more difficult to come across in English. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, yeah, Leslie Key, who's in the film, mm -hmm. um, who who's a photographer of the Out in Japan project. Mm -hmm. um, he also made this really beautiful short film that I remember we uh, that I saw at the 2016. Tokyo Rainbow Reels. So, um, yeah, I'm, I don't know if it's available online or anything. <laughs> but I'll keep you posted. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Thank you. In the film, there's the discussion that prior to the Meiji um, period, um, mm -hmm. that the, there there was more there was more of a queer scene. There was more of a like an acceptance um, through the little bit that we've read of Japanese history that does seem to be true um but what what are your experiences with that it's it's complicated um there's so much history there and one of the things we wanted we made a distinction at a certain point was to um keep the film rooted in the contemporary moment mm -hmm. and touch on history when it comes up but um to make a film about queer history in japan is like that could be a 10-hour mini series on its own that's <laughs> true that is very true mm -hmm. but um yeah there's a lot of fascinating history there uh i've read a few books about it uh one i recommend is cartographies of desire male male love um, or male expressions of male male desire in the Edo period and beyond. And um, that book talks about how there were all these publications, um, books of poetry, artwork, um, celebrating especially male male sexuality, but um, there were definitely places for transgender expression in Buto and mm -hmm. other forms of art um so it's I, i'm sorry not in, in buto I, I meant to say um kabuki uh oh, okay. okay yeah form um so the yeah there are all of these historical um references to mm. different kinds of sexuality in that were accepted in various ways but it wasn't mm. necessarily like a blanket acceptance of all queer identity and sadly there's not a lot of um uh historical record of lesbian sexuality other than mm -hmm. some art pieces but um it, unfortunately all of that got swept under the rug um during the modernization of japan in the meiji period and hiromi i, I wonder if you have any insight as someone who grew up learning japanese history if you ever um were taught things like that? Um, actually, things like that were never taught in the Japanese history classes. So I, again, I didn't know about that queer scene mm -hmm. in the later period. So that, so actually um, um, the Junko Mitsuhashi, the professor, the transgender professor, she actually taught me about um, that queer scene in Edo period. And I, so again, I learned that from this film. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 That's, that's awesome. So even mm -hmm. for you, um, like even though you had friends, um, part of that, um, that wasn't something that you really grew up learning. No. Yeah, I mean, the, I could say the same. Mm -hmm. It's not something that we learn in school. Right. It's, you know, mm -hmm. 
well, especially growing up in the South. But <laughs> well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's an added thing. layer. That's, <laughs> um, but, but it's true. Like we, we learn a sort of straight washed version of history. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we have poets that were queer, like Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson, and, mm -hmm. and they're taught in schools, but that usually isn't the focus of the conversation. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Or e even, even people, um, even, even people like, like Oscar Wilde or like, or like Sappho, where it's like, oh, you know, they're just writing about really good friends. It's, <laughs> Yeah, no. Yeah, the they're, they're just, oh, they're just best they're friends. Just friends. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Um I get I guess I guess kind of a similar parallel. This is just off the top of my head. I don't mm -hmm. know how much I don't know how much relation to reality this might have, but as an American, uh I would not be at all surprised if somebody were just like hey by the way did you know that in the uh post-civil war west uh cowboys were there there was a lot of of homosexuality uh, i'd be like oh that totally makes sense yeah i see what but, you're saying but the way that you're raised it's like this hyper masculine mm. you know aggressively straight thing but it's sort of similar to how if somebody says a lot of people living in the Edo period mm -hmm. uh you know there there was more <laughs> homosexuality than you're necessarily taught mm -hmm. about you know which I mean that, that goes that goes for every period of history it's not like it's something mm -hmm. that just like where'd it come from it just yeah. popped up <laughs> you know <laughs> like, right. like how a lot of people seem to treat it mm -hmm. but yeah so I'm, there's a lot of delusion and people thinking like oh queer all these different queer genders and sexualities that's a new trend but it's been in part of history for a really mm -hmm. like, as long as we can look back mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah but i i think i i guess what, I, what i'm kind of hearing the consensus at least in, in this discussion between us is that un, unless you really seek that out yourself you're not necessarily going to find it yeah and definitely. that's why that's why films like like um, queer Japan and like mm -hmm. and doing kind of discussions like this is really helpful to try to bring that to light, mm. um, and that's why we're here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, do Do you think from a more from a more modern perspective, just from what you have been able to observe in your lifetime, with the birth rate declining, do you have you seen any sort of greater or lesser even acceptance of of queer people um it's now just specifically in japan so oh yeah specifically in japan um, mm -hmm. actually the decrease of uh, the birth rate mm -hmm. i mean oh okay there are like politicians and people who like to blame it to queer community lgbtq people mm -hmm. because they just need some some kind of like excuse or something or someone to blame it for mm -hmm. but in the reality and also the people are aware that that's not causing that that lgbtq community or queer community is not the cause of um that is creating the it decrease of the birth rate it's just the society and the system that is causing mm -hmm. like for example um unfortunately we don't have much like a good support or oh, i see some animal in the background oh yes <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> our dog Hi. Oh, that's lovely sorry is it my attention <laughs> anyway. so um a, yeah so um so that's the system and like um we don't have much support or good support for like working mothers or like uh the problem with like kindergartens it's so difficult to get into the kindergartens in so many like regulations and and conditions so the everything the society itself and the system is making it difficult for us to raise a child so i think that's the and people are aware of that. And, but there are still some 
people just wanted to say that, you know, it's just because of the, the, the LGBTQ people, you know, they are more like people, they don't, they, um, you know, there was a footage about one of the politician talked about that in a film. Mm, right. Um, so they are not like productive or something like that. And, right, right. Mm -hmm. you know, so there are still people think like that, but I think it's already um, uh, the way of that thinking is not cool anymore. And mm -hmm. people are more aware of the reality. So I think that's changing. Yeah. I see a hope in that, you know, um, scene. Yeah, do you, that that actually uh, goes into something else that we we wanted to ask about. Do you see a difference in the acceptance of of uh, queer just queerness in general? Do you see a difference between the ages of people? Like, are older people less accepting or more accepting than younger people, or do you not see any mm. sort of relation between ages? Mm. I think that the younger people. Are more like uh, flexible to for the new some you know new things, and younger generations are like more and more like feel comfortable to like come out. Mm -hmm. So I've seen uh, yeah I was um, discussing about that with Graham and um, <clears throat> you know with the application the social networking service called Clubhouse mm -hmm. that is exploding in japan right now it's been here for about two weeks okay. it's a bit more wow. <laughs> so it's now happening in japan and and i was listening to some of like uh, conversation in the rooms and there were like teenagers like high school boys mm -hmm. um they talked about their sexuality mm -hmm on one of those like lgbtq themes room themed rooms oh. and also in uh, the culture the fashion and the culture mm. uh feel of the world there are more like um not only for the queer people but all like other minorities are mm. featured beginning to feature in those like culture and fashion fields so there are more like visible than before so more I, I think they're more like accepted in younger generations and along with that the older generation kind of has to like follow or because the younger generation is beginning to rule the world now mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a good change I think yeah that I I can ag agree I with that like seeing that it, um in in North America just how it it does seem to be that the the younger generations are more flexible like you said and more understanding mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm here for it <laughs> like, <laughs> let, let love be love <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Also, it's a trend that continues and mm -hmm. we see more and more acceptance around the world mm -hmm. yeah absolutely one of our friends who has lived in Japan for a while. Almost um, a decade. Yeah, he, they, yeah. They've, they've told me in the past that their perception, um, ha having lived there for so long, is that with celebrities, it's more of an acceptable thing to, to, be, to be openly queer, to be any, anything LGBTQ plus but that as a private individual it's less acceptable publicly mm. do you do you find that to be true um yes and no i think um it is yes because um the celebrities they are visible you know mm -hmm. i think that's the big difference between like um like general, general citizens and celebrities so once it's like visual and the like media bring them on like TVs or mostly TVs, mm -hmm. um, it's a, a very, I think it's very unique like nationality thing mm -hmm. that we tend to 
think what we see on TV is like something is okay or something acceptable. We have that kind of like way of thinking. It's like, um, which is not good because you know people should have their own mind and own way of thinking. Mm -hmm. But it's like uh, what do you call it? Like um, mind. Uh, what's the word? Like mind control. Yes, mind controlled by the media. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing that celebrities are more like queer celebrities more like accepted. Mm -hmm. Okay. But like I said, um, for the like general citizens, they be they began to be accepted like more mm -hmm. and more mm -hmm. than before, and I think um, uh, the big contribution is that social networking service is helping to like um to find like a new connection within the community or to find um, someone like, you know, to, to find this uh, like, uh, um, 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 uh, what you call it? Like a, a similar minded person. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So I think that's helping, yeah. Do you think that with, with the concept of like, if it's on media, it's okay, um, do you find or think maybe like with oh it's on social media so it's okay like is social media almost like a stepping stone between the private individual versus the person who's on like the celebrity on the meet on so on not on social media on media like on on billboards and magazines and TV. Mm. is social media kind of like a in an in between almost yeah yeah exactly Okay. And more people are like showing their personality on social medias. Like for example, I see more rainbow flags on the, their profiles. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the biggest change, and that, that's like the sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a it's it's kind of an an easy way to to show that representation without having to be so like. Yeah. about it which I, either way you know however you want to be and however mm -hmm. you want to represent yourself is is you know that's the way you should do it but it's an easy way to mm -hmm. just say like hey like i'm part of this and but also yeah. if you if you live in an area like speaking as somebody who lives in america if you live in an area of the country where you might not necessarily feel as safe safe yeah being mm -hmm. publicly um displaying you know mm -hmm. like having a uh, rainbow flag mm -hmm. like on your house or like a bumper sticker or something like that mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. on social media that that sort of abstracts it like one level mm -hmm. so that yeah. you would at least assume that the only people who are going to be seeing that are your friends not necessarily like your co-workers mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you know what I mean or random yeah. strangers who might who, who might give you crap about it yeah or something like that. yeah find, like an anonymous uh identity yes. on websites like twitter or mm. um what's the what's the other one house call is that what it's called the clubhouse clubhouse the cl clubhouse yeah because yeah, it's just audio so you can yeah. put, you can put your thoughts out there without showing your face mm -hmm. that's kind of important because in schools and in workplaces in japan there's not a lot of uh, anti-discrimination protection mm -hmm. there is not a national law against um, discrimination in the workplace if you're LGBTQ um, and that's something we're working on in other countries too including America mm -hmm. it varies from state to state at this point but um, it makes it harder to come out if you don't know if you'll be fired right mm -hmm. right yeah yeah exactly but that social media kind of gives you that like you know you, you're you're able to make it private you're able yeah. you know so yeah. you can you, you can be yourself a little bit more i suppose and you can like if if you have a coworker or or something who is less accepting then you have the option of just saying oh, i don't i don't have a i don't yeah. have a facebook or i don't have a twitter mm -hmm. or or whatever yeah. and and just kind of 
stopping them from seeing it or yeah. something like that. It gives you the opportunity to filter people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning that there aren't any sort of national um, protections from like workplace discrimination or anything like that. This is this is only sort of tangentially related to that, but something that you touched on in the film is how over the course of the last decade or so, more and more uh, municipalities or maybe even entire prefectures, I'm not sure, are starting to recognize uh, unions between same-sex couples. Mm. Um, and may maybe this is just me drawing a connection where it doesn't exist, but it feels to me like that is similar to what happened in America um, leading up to the 2015 Supreme Court decision where it was gay marriage was recognized uh, federally, where it was like little places one at a time until it ramped up to enough that they had to make a decision about it. Mm. Do, you, do you feel like sort of the same thing is happening in Japan and that sooner than later, uh, there's going to have to be some sort of national decision on recognizing or not recognizing gay marriage? Mm. Um, I think there is hope. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, because um, yeah, just like you said, you know, when we film, I mean, actually, when we filmed our film, or and when we finished our film in nine, uh, twenty nineteen, there were only like seventeen cities and towns recognized same sex um partnerships. Mm -hmm. But now, as of now, I think there are more like more than like 70 cities oh, wow. are recognizing. So it's expanding little by little, but it is actually changing. So I, I think there is a strong hope for that, you know, the, our country, our law will be, yeah, changed. Yeah. And there, are, yeah, there is also an organization called like Japan Marriage for All or something. Uh, what was the name? I should say it correctly. Hold on. This um, is something Gon Matsunaka is part of, I think. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Oh, it's oh the Marriage for All Japan. Mm -hmm. Well, it was established in uh, two years ago, and they have been really, really active, and also. So many like politicians are supporting and joining that organization, so which is a great thing. And um, yeah, yeah, it's amazing how quickly it has grown. Um, I think 2014 was maybe the first um, municipality that that legalized this partnership certificate program in Setagaya or Shibuya, yeah. those were the mm -hmm. first two. Mm -hmm. And um, Aya Kamikawa, who you, the politician you see in the film, she was instrumental in making that happen in Setagaya. And so now for there to be like 60, 70 areas in Japan with this law is really impressive. There's a lot of momentum. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, that's absolutely. exciting. Yeah. And you, uh, what did what did you say they're they're called, uh, Graham? The, the, the certificate certificate program. It's similar to like civil unions, how okay. the, those existed before gay marriage in the United States. Mm -hmm. That that was I, I was going to ask. So so is it similar to civil unions where like certain protections are given, but it's not recognized at the same level as marriage, essentially. Exactly. Um, it's in a lot of cases, it's kind of a contract with the city and the city asks businesses, hospitals, renters or um, rental agencies to respect this documentation, but it's kind of legally non-binding. Mm. I see. Oh, okay. I see. All right. Because it doesn't have the same like legal heft as, as marriage does. Mm okay okay so nobody's necessarily required to follow it yeah it's mm -hmm. it's um there's a system called the koseki the family register in japan that is um 
quite rigid. <laughs> it's been around yeah. about a hundred years, uh, more than a hundred years, and it it documents all families and marriages in um, every city in Japan. And it's very hard to change. Um, there have been multiple groups trying to change the Koseki system, including um, people who want to keep their last name after marrying their husband mm -hmm. or wife. Um, right now, the Koseki makes you choose one last name or the other. So um, mm. there's, I think, uh, from a few different angles, people who really want to change that system. Yeah. Okay. I, I feel like I've seen that come up in some of the movies we've watched mm -hmm. and even some anime mm -hmm. that I've watched that it's like briefly been touched on, but I, I didn't know the extent of, of the Koseki and, and what in, is involved with that. I, I kind of wish we could have spent more time explaining the Koseki in the film, but it's also like mm -hmm. not a very cinematic concept. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of tricky. Que mm -hmm. Queer Japan too. You gotta you gotta follow from now <laughs> until it's legalized. Un until yeah. gay marriage is legalized yeah. and you just you document the entire thing yes. as it's happening. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's a plan. <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, on I, I guess sort of sort sort of kind of on a similar note, mm. how about trans rights in Japan? Because mm. if I'm if I'm remembering correctly from when we did the Shinjuku Boys episode, Aya Kamikawa was the first elected official in the history of Japan that was trans, right? Yeah, uh, first openly transgender elected official. Um, and so she she uh, was elected five years after that Shinjuku Boys documentary was made. Mm -hmm. And right after she was elected, she actually helped pass this um, law to uh, recognize transgender people's actual gender markers that they want on their IDs. Unfortunately, it has all these restrictions right. that yeah. have been um hard to remove the the trans there have been trans um activists who have brought it to the supreme court and mm -hmm. unfortunately the supreme court upheld that law and its regulations so um it's something people are trying to change yeah yeah mm -hmm. so for for the time being there have been attempts to advance uh trans rights through through the law but it's kind of still at the same place where it was like 15 or 20 years ago is what it sounds like. That's right. Oh. It's, it was kind of a law that um, really looked at trans identity from a medical scientific perspective. Right. Um, using this disorder that's no longer used in the DSM called gender identity disorder. Mm -hmm. um, so that is kind of an old-fashioned way of looking at gender even though it's 20 years later is that um that's talked about in the film when when it's discussing like the there are like the five different prerequisites in order to yes is, is yes. that the same yeah. okay and you have to hit all of them yeah yeah i i don't know when america's laws about that changed but I've been watching this uh, documentary on HBO Max called uh, The Lady in the Dale. Mm -hmm. And it's about, it takes place in the 70s. And it's about a trans woman who um, tried to make this car. And then she ended up in a huge legal battle. And mm -hmm. at that time, America had some of the same stipulations for trans people. You can't have children you have to have a hysterectomy or have your um, your reproductive organs removed mm -hmm. and all these things that have been, this, that the other um, countries have decided are a violation of human rights. Right, mm -hmm. right, right, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, you know, with films like this and mm -hmm. with, um, you know, like we've talked about with younger, the younger generation mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. being more flexible and that, that will, Again, like Hiromi had mentioned, that that's that hope that we will see changes in that. Yeah, sooner than later. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. In in closing, if you if both both of you 
could have viewers take away just like a single thing from mm. this interview or the film what what would you want that thing to be um can i go first just one word hope that's it i Thank love you. that i love that <laughs> uh, um i i think the message that i that comes to mind when I think of queer Japan is just there are unlimited ways of being in the world um, and they're all beautiful. So I think that's what I want people to come away with when they watch this film, just an open mind to different ways of being in the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's good. That's awesome. That's really great. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Yes. <laughs> Everyone well, should watch this. <laughs> yeah, if we yes, haven't reiterated it. Yes, <laughs> everyone go see it. And on that note, uh, I know you had mentioned that coming up soon, there's going to be a further release. Mm. Where right now and in the future, where can anybody who's watching this find the film? So um, currently we have distribution in North America. So if you're in the US or Canada, you can find it on uh, virtual theatrical platforms. So that's there's a platform called Theatrical at Home that um, allows you to buy a ticket and support a local theater um, with your purchase. So you can either do that or you can find it on VOD platforms like iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, and um, it's available for rent there now. And next month we'll have the Blu-ray and DVD coming out. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Yeah. All right. And well, links and, in the description. And and we'll we'll be like we had mentioned before. We'll be keeping you all updated oh, yeah. on um, on that release. Mm -hmm. We'll post about it in the community tab and on Twitter and everything yeah, like that. Definitely. So be sure to check back. All that yeah. good stuff later in you said the end of March, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mid to mid to, end mid mid to late, late March. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned on our social media at Queer Japan. We'll mm -hmm. announce the release date um, and it will post some pictures of the Blu-ray when it's out. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And um and speaking of that, are there are there any other places where people can follow you and and um like get in contact with you if they need to or you know just see what else you're you're making in the future sure um i have a website it's just my name grahamcolbeans.com and you can also find me on instagram at, at grahamcolbeans oh well um, um i'm not very active but um i have um instagram and twitter called hero media eight H I R O M E D I A eight. All right. All right. Oh, you can reach me that. All right. And we can all probably of, all of it'll be in the description. In the description. Yeah. We yeah. Can link all of it. So go go check them go check them all out. Yeah. All that good stuff. Uh, and I think that's everything. Think yeah. So. Thank you yeah. so much. Oh, thank you. Yes, this it's has been so en enlightening, mm -hmm. and I I'm I'm so so grateful to both of you for um you know have, having this opportunity to have these kinds of discussions that people really need to be having right now and and hopefully yeah. you know reaching people who need to hear um the messages that we're that we've been discussing yeah um, thanks kylie thanks eli yeah. i feel like this film it, it's a great reminder of what it's like to be in community so if yeah. you're stuck at home missing going out to the party going to the bar watch queer japan and um remember what that felt like <laughs> yeah uh -huh. true yeah, true so true well thank uh, you again yeah. thank you both all right thank you all right. thank you we'll see you later Sayonara. okay bye Sayonara. Thank you.